Hallo, mein Name ist Petra Pölzl. Ich bin die künstlerische Leitung von Kunstpavillon und Neugalerie Innsbruck. Im Jahr 2022 trägt das Programm in beiden Ausstellungshäusern die Headline Dancing at the Edge of the World, gemäß der gleichnamigen Essay-Sammlung von Ursula Le Guin. In dieser skizziert die Science-Fiction-Autorin alternative soziale und gesellschaftliche Möglichkeitsräume, die nicht in einer kolonialen, patriarchalen oder xenophoben Erzählstruktur verankert sind. Den Auftakt machen die beiden Ausstellungen Options von Riccardo Giacone im Kunstpavillon sowie die Ausstellung Archives of Resistance and Repair in der Neuen Galerie Innsbruck. Mit Arbeiten von Shiraz Bachu, Maeve Brennan und Onyeka Igwe. Ausgehend von dieser Ausstellung, welche von Julia de Fabo und Lexington Davis kuratiert wurde, sprechen der Künstler Shiraz Bachu und die Kuratorin Julia de Fabo in der folgenden Radiosendung über persönliches und kulturelles Erbe und darüber, in welchem Zusammenhang die Vergangenheit mit der Gegenwart steht. Fragen wie, was verraten uns Archive über die Geschichtsschreibung, welche Erzählungen negieren sie und wie kann ein bewusster Umgang mit der Vergangenheit und ihrem fortbestehenden Erbe gelingen, stehen in der kommenden Stunde im Fokus des Gesprächs. I'm Julia DeFebo, one of the curators of the exhibition Archives of Resistance and Repair at Neue Gallery Innsbruck. The exhibition looks at the way that contemporary artists are rethinking historical archives to reveal a hidden side of history or stories of the past that are often left untold. It features the work of three artists, Shiraz Beju, Maeve Brennan, and Onyeka Igwe. And today I'm speaking to one of those artists, Shiraz Beju. Shiraz works across film, painting, photography, performance, and installation, often incorporating archival images and sounds. Much of his practice looks at the islands of the Western Indian Ocean, such as Mauritius, where he was born, and the region's relationship to the wider world. Shiraz's installation in the Neue Gallery exhibition includes a range of materials that draw connections between past and present overpainted maps, collages of archival materials, and contemporary photographs taken inside and around Shiraz's grandmother's home revealed the layered ways that places and histories are interlinked. A black and white photograph of the sea covers three of the walls, reaching from floor to ceiling. It alludes to the vastness and the power of the ocean and the way that the sea brings together seemingly disparate lands. Throughout the installation, Shiraz's work addresses themes of cultural memory and post-colonial nationhood in a way that challenges dominant cultural narratives. Welcome, Shiraz. Hey, Julia. What do we mean when we talk about challenging the dominant cultural narrative? I guess one of the important things to think about, first of all, that it's when we talk about um, challenging um, dominant narratives, it's not necess it's not about erasing dominant narratives or even taking away um, the, the space or platform or the importance of what a cultural narrative might mean to, to a nation. It's about the stories that don't get heard. And if you're an individual within society and there are that, that you know, the, the mainstream conversations, the mainstream ways of understanding the identity, the history, where a nation comes from, where a nation is headed to, if those things are difficult for you to, for you to find reflection in, then then often you know we can find that there are groups of us within societies that start to no longer feel like they are necessarily part of 
of what takes place in the nation, part of the, the collective experience. And I think that starts to create lots of different types of problems in society. And so when we talk about these cultural narratives that are perhaps the marginalised narratives, narratives that are perhaps often not so comfortable to be spoken about. And I guess this is where we often enter into the space of what we call, you know, the, you know, decolonizing histories, decolonizing spaces, exploring what their legacies have been, you know, and how they continue to perhaps form the way in which we imagine ourselves and how perhaps by having a wider understanding of our past and how that influences our contemporary moment, we can perhaps have a deeper and, and, and better understanding of ourselves. We can perhaps, you know, craft a stronger pathway forward culturally and then and ultimately in the way that we imagine ourselves, you know, and, and perhaps in a sense, you know, if, if your own sense of yourself is not necessarily one that is empowered or you don't necessarily feel you have agency within a society, perhaps these are some of the, the pathways in which we can we can change that, we can improve that for people, people can find better reflection, I guess. This idea of bringing the past together with the present really comes through in your work. Could you explain how that features in your research and how that manifests itself in your physical exhibitions and your installations? Well, I spend a lot of time, um, for sure, with archives, you know, looking at lots of different types of, of visual material. I mean, the main focus of my work is, is, um, is, the, is, is the Western Indian Ocean, East Africa, Mauritius, my, my own place of origin, being very much at the centre of that. And so I have, I've often spent a lot of time looking at materials in, often in, in major Western museums, collections, um, looking at materials that relate to these regions. So I, I think it's important to, to place sort of different forms of research and different forms of recording next to each other so for sure there is also a lot of academic writing that I look through in terms of um, socio-political um, and kind of new anthropological writing um, around the region often about histories that have not been recorded and you know some fantastic work that today has been done in piecing together oral histories and different forms of research in order to create wider and, and, and more complex understandings of, of these spaces. But also that is also then placed against things like, you know, sort of looking at vernacular um, tellings of histories, the recording of histories from within communities as well. And how, you know, often we, we might talk about these as folklores or, or things that um, enter into kind of local myths, but, but often they are ways of understanding and processing very traumatic histories. So, so I kind of try and place these different forms of research against each other to navigate um, many of these questions, because for sure, I don't arrive at a, at a, at a, at a subject or a project with, um, and I don't think you, you, you can, or, or you should be that, that you arrive at it with the answers beforehand. It's, it's the process of piecing together these different pieces of thinking and often knowledge and knowledge that has either been lost or was never deemed important enough to be recorded in traditional ways. And so often we find ourselves as artists entering into this space where we are often creating the archive as well by piecing together these different pieces of, of, of thinking and, and research. And this often then works its way into quite a lot of different forms of making. You know, as you mentioned, you know, I, I work through quite a lot of different mediums. And in a way, it's about, you know, how different kinds of making can bring us to different sort of proximities to the subject, with different sort of degrees of sensitivity to towards what perhaps is needed. Um, for example, I, I often use film work as a way to kind of explore the landscape of a space, the broad, the broad strokes or the backdrop to which installations and paintings and, and sculptures and things like this can perhaps unravel um, more intimate, more nuanced um, narratives within it. So in this way, I kind of build my exhibitions as a sort of cosmology of, our, of objects that have different types of interrelations and different ways of which we could read the connections between things, because for sure there isn't one singular reading. And I don't want it to be, obviously, as you know, as the artist presenting these materials in front of you, there is the authoring and voice of, of my own position behind it, no doubt. 
but also it's important that it is in a way that allows the audience to be able to create their own readings and, and see their own connections between these. Because these are very complex stories, you know, they expand across large spaces and bring lots of different groups of people together. And sort of, I guess, in that way, when we're trying to understand what can perhaps be described as creolization or hybridity and identity, how, how we have survived you know, some of the most complex and difficult moments in our histories as people, how that reflects in who we are, in our cultures, in our, and, you know, and perhaps these are actually these pathways of survival that we've developed as people. And, you know, you know, throughout different cultures, throughout different parts of the world. And perhaps in this way, this kind of, of not necessarily storytelling, but placing these different elements together allow us to perhaps understand pathways forward that and, and I think certainly narratives that we definitely need at this moment in terms of how do we overcome the problems that are going to be coming our way. archives to create these installations, such as photographs that are then transformed into sculptural paintings and into ceramic pieces. In the exhibition at Neue Gallery, for example, there's an installation in a museum vitrine, and included in that vitrine there are collages of archival images, and those are placed next to maps and figures from colonial era books and other small archival items. I'm wondering, do you find these archival materials first? and then you make the work based on what you found? Or do you kind of have an artwork in mind that you want to make, and then you go and search for the right archive to fit your vision? I mean, for sure, it's a journey. And I think, I, you know, the, the beginning of any project really is about, you know, series of questions. And it's by embarking upon that, those series of questions that that's, I guess, in a way, a pathway kind of opens itself up. One piece of reading might lead you to inquire in a different direction. I mean, it's one of the most difficult things, I guess, about starting new pieces of research or thinking is that the net is almost has to be so wide. I'm sure, you know, lots and lots of PhD researchers, students out there that understand how difficult it is to begin because you don't want to eliminate any direction of thinking too early on the possibilities are almost always so enormous right in the, in the way that i was explaining before how complex and multi-layered these um, these spaces are often you then arrive at a space uh, something that reveals itself symbolically often it perhaps it's a physical space but perhaps it's it's through literature or thinking a, a piece of a letter it's all kinds of different things that can then be the moment at which you say this work needs to manifest this needs to centrally manifest this work. And I think it's at that point that we start to think about how and what would be the medium, the best medium and, and way to do that. And often things need to be time based. We need to be able to sense, um, you know, the flux, the movement of things, um, the change of things within an artwork. And so often things may, for example, lend themselves to moving image. And, and in other in other places, you know, perhaps things need to be more materially based they need to be perhaps more emotionally connecting to us often because things are so complex how do we often express these very difficult ideas or possibilities of being and so we often you know we have to perhaps you know navigate through different sort of forms of, of making in order to bring it together which is why often it is more than just one form one more than just one media of making in an exhibition and do you have a story of one archive that you encountered that was particularly powerful or that struck you that you said, I have to make an artwork from this? All the archives that I've worked with have been, you know, they are incredibly revealing, even in the smallest amounts of, you know, even the smallest note in a letter can be something that really reveals the psychological context in which uh, the environment in which things are taking place. I, I think you know, there are also often many little things that you really want to work with, 
but perhaps it's not always ethically the right time or the right space in which to work with something. So I think that is also sometimes the flip side of that is to when to know when something needs to be held back with. I mean, this is one of those things about working with particularly, you know, very complex material that relates to slavery and bondage. There are, you know, there are many, many ethical questions that need to be navigated around working with this kind of material, which is why it's always important to be working as much as possible within community, with community, in order to be able to reflect the right kind of language, particularly at this moment in time, it's important for us that, you know, often these narratives are, are voiced from within the communities and so and it's so in some ways part of the pathway is, is is to be able to enable that I think also as artists. I think that's a really interesting and crucial point really because so many of these archives were made as tools of colonization. Um, they were used to subjugate people yeah and so to what to what ends can we rethink them to what ends can they be reused in artistic practices and to what ends do we have to kind of let them go um, or, or, you know, still show them, Absolutely. but really within a, a, a context that is understood? Absolutely. I mean, if anything, you know, when, when you come across, you know, very, very powerful collections, if anything, the material often is too powerful you know, is is too complex to present just like that, just directly. And, and one has to take a lot of time to process and think through how, how you're going to navigate, how you're going to express that. And so there is often a lot of revisiting in a way before, I, for example, in the Enfamille painting series, there is, you know, this is a group of, of, of portraits that were taken from within a, a, a colonial family household where the sort of the, the, the camera has, has been pointed towards the house slaves and servants and it took me a long time to think about whether I should even work with those images work with this portraiture but what was so incredibly important to, to understand was that these are very rare portraits for example particularly in this setting and so perhaps that you know that there wasn't there was an importance in terms of of the knowledge sharing that that these identities have not been erased completely but also at the same time but do you know do we place them into a polemic or a political space in the statement that we make with them um, and so actually in the end it was about laying them into these jewelry trays that had been my 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 great aunts in the, in the 50s she had been a jeweler and they sort of stack these jewelry trays almost like a sort of archival box so these these portraits are paint are, are placed into these very lightly painted surfaces wooden surfaces where they're almost present but they're almost half disappearing away and it was that kind of act of remembrance but also an act of of laying to rest and that's I think is often we have to kind of navigate quite deep in, in terms of ourselves in thinking about what are the interpretations or the what are the ramifications of of um of these images and I think we have to navigate through a space of honesty within ourselves as individuals you certainly can't author somebody else's pain but you can for sure navigate through your own experiences of how you've dealt with traumas in your own life as human beings there are many things that we share right psychologically emotionally these are things that we can be, be fairly certain about are things that that we may respond in certain ways in in similarly and so in that sort of way i think it's important that we, we navigate through our own selves and thinking about how and what do these images mean in you know in a very truthful and sensitive kind of way i think um and so then we perhaps we can then arrive at a place where the where these works have a, have a way of of being present but also you know the act of laying to rest and I think in, in in that way it is it is almost slightly archaeological in a way that the process of my practice because you know as with your previous question you know that what comes first you know the the artwork or the or the re or, or the archive or the research it is about often arriving in a space and thinking about what is the language of that place what is the what are the aesthetics of that place that allow us to exp to to tell its importance rather than necessarily the other way around. I think that leads us nicely into my next question, actually, which is about the role of personal memory versus cultural memory. So you've just mentioned your great aunt's jewelry trays. You also have photographs that are contemporary photographs 
that you've taken into in your grandmother's house in Mauritius. These are really personal artifacts and places that you use within your work. How do you reconcile these moments of personal memory with a larger story relating to a wider kind of cultural memory? It, you know, it's important that we navigate through through space within ourselves, a space of honesty in a way, um, in terms of our, our own emotional interpretation of these stories, of these histories. There are a lot of spaces and a lot of representation of things that come from from within my own family. But something that I had I had definitely avoided, particularly as a younger artist, was not to make work that that was autobiographical in any kind of or biographical in that kind of sense. Because I guess in, in partly because I know that the space that I came from, a new post-colony, the island state, are incredibly loaded environments. If you're reading about colonial history, if you're if you're interested in the legacies of slavery, then these places reveal so much about it, and you cannot escape it. It is right there. It is so, it is so sedimentary. The layers they are very very visible because these places are small. Their histories are often very short because they're often uninhabited places before before the plantation, before before that kind of colonization, and they are very very reflective of what that legacy of slavery is of what what that means to bring people so many different groups of people together under very very pressurized situations so in that sense i always knew that that making work around you know my own place of origin was going to be something very very powerful and in a sense i guess i kind of avoided it as a younger artist because i wanted to develop my craft i guess and to make sure that i was able to have the language to begin to speak about it so in that sense i've kind of avoided things being too personal but then when when it was the right moment for me to shift my practice and start to focus upon upon the region I knew that you know it, I obviously I had I had much closer access within communities to, to be able to engage these conversations in the first place so in that sense certainly the personal space the family the community space is something that you know allows you to embark upon that research um, I think particularly, you know, for, for lots of young artists, musicians, writers of all sorts, um, I think we'll understand, you know, that, that this is often a space, you know, that, that what you have access to allows you to perhaps start to begin some of your most in-depth work as a person. But also you don't want to necessarily, you know, um, release that too quickly either, right? You don't want to be a one-hit wonder with one album, you know? I think there is that dynamic. I mean, I certainly thought about that as a young artist. So, so when the time was right, there are, there are pathways in, in your personal space and there are reflections, you know, there are much deeper questions. When I decided that I needed to make a film, with the, the Ile de France film, I, I was sat in my grandmother's house and I was looking at the crumbling concrete, the way that concrete crumbles very differently in the tropics, you know, seeing the vines of plants that were slowly seeping through and these sort of little patchworks of, of concrete on these old, old that had patched up these old stone walls. And this was a little, a little apartment, you could say, that was part of the old Governor de Forge's house, or supposedly the old Governor de Forge's house in Mauritius, which would have been a huge, you know, a very major, um, you know, a very large um, colonial house. And at this point, you know, in time, it had been broken up into lots of small dwellings because, you know, in the late 19th century, when they were, where, where there were sort of widespread malaria epidemics, you know, not just in Mauritius, but across all sort of British colonies, colonist families, which were often living in sort of trader houses near the ports to be close to business. You know, they, they vacated these spaces and they went to places like the hill, the hilltop, the hill station. These became, these became inhabited. And, and so a lot of these houses then got taken over by ex-slave families and indentured labour families. And so this kind of multi-layering of people, of history, of how we survive, and these these are the interiors of these of these homes. You know, they reflect all of those layers. You know, and all of how we've had to sort of twist and change ourselves to be able to exist around these monoliths. So that was a space where I, I I sat there thinking about how do I how do I describe the complexity of that, and that was when I realised that it had to be a moving image work. And so in this sense, you know, these personal spaces, you know, that we spend time in. They definitely give us the inspiration to 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 begin these works. Mauritius, you know, is one of these places that is so you know beautifully complex and 
you know, it's so expressive of it as well. You can walk around the port city, Port Louis, and you can read on the facades of these old stone storehouses and warehouses you know not that there's a huge amount of it left but you could navigate the history the history you know the history of that of that port through those buildings it's interesting to see how architecture features in your work because you know you don't immediately think of um the role of architecture when you see your work it's a lot of a lot of painting a lot of sculpture a lot of photography but the photographs reflect the architecture the moving image works reflect the architecture what do these buildings of the past mean to us today? I'm thinking also about the Neue Gallery is situated within the Habsburg Imperial Palace. This is a historic building that's now being used in a different way. How, how do we navigate the architecture of the past in our contemporary lives? Well, I mean, that was one of the first questions that I asked when I when I embarked on on, on this research many years ago. You know, what, why is it that that, you know, for example, the you know the new independent state why is it that often you find the governor's building as 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 part of the houses of parliament or or you know or the new state that often these symbols of of colonial what would have been the ultimate symbols of of um of power and oppression within your 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 immediate environment um how often you know they they navigate into being you know parts of the same architecture of the new democratic state and and i guess there is something about not being able to escape your past because you know for sure it's not just about holding on to what are the best buildings in that that are left over which is often the case but you know many things are left to decay many relics of the past are left to decay and there are certain ones that are held on to and that's one of the questions that i was really interested in where does that choice take place what is it that we're holding on to and what is it that that we're willing to let go of so things like you know the the opera house in port louis something that that has fallen into disrepair you know statues of cleopatra that would have once been there because of um i guess what would have been called the planter class and their cultural calendar these would have been objects that were reflective of that and yet things like the british governor's house is held on to you know as the presidential palace and so I, I guess there was a there's a, there's a real question for for new nations and 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 they, without a doubt we 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 do this right collectively in in um, in the forming of that identity is we decide what we hold on to and what we let go of and I guess there are parts of our past that we cannot escape and for sure if you are in a post colony space. Decolonization is not an academic pursuit. It is the reality of rebuilding yourself, rebuilding your nation, and somehow defining what your future will be for yourself. Self authorship. And so, you know, I guess there are certain amounts that you cannot escape. You cannot escape the fact that you are a slave colony. You cannot escape the fact that, you know, 400,000 indentured laborers were brought to to the island, you know, to experiment as a, as, as a replacement of slavery. You can't escape these very, very big social dynamics, these very, very big mechanisms, these very big movements of people that took place. These are things that cannot be escaped. But I think also in a reverse way in Europe, we have to ask ourselves when we hold on to these institutions, you know, in a sense, they are monuments. Because these buildings were often expressions of power, expressions of wealth, you know, in, in a very successful way. And when we hold on to them, perhaps part of their historical significance or their archi or the architectural language or beauty or importance that perhaps we place in that way, we still have to ask ourselves, you know, ultimately, what is it that we're holding on to collectively as the nation? And, you know, I think it is important that things like that, things are reappropriated into cultural institutions, that we are allowed these pathways within these spaces within which to, to critique, to explore what they still mean for us. For sure, it's not about erasing the history is often the question, you know, particularly here in Britain right now, you know, a major, major question is, is this pushback against not removing monuments? I mean, I'm not against destroying monuments per se. I'm, I, I'm in favour of demoting them. Why do they need to necessarily take these very central places in, in, our, in our contemporary society when we, we could perhaps be having other symbols or, or individuals or whatever that, that, re that reflect us? But through that process, we allow ourselves you know, to reevaluate where we are now and how we are in relation to, you know, to our past. And, and decolonization is not something that only affects 
you know, the global south, for those of us from the global south, it is something that actually benefits all people because it allows us to honestly think about the way in which we move forward collectively as a society. And for sure, we can't leave anyone behind. That's one thing we know. Drawing together this world in Mauritius and the Indian Ocean with then what we were talking about in Europe, perhaps too bitterly, the space between these places is the ocean, but the sea does feature in your work. Let's listen now to an extract from the beginning of your film entitled Ile de France. The sea features in other film works and installation works as well. And in fact, the backdrop of the exhibition at the Neue Gallery is the striking black and white photograph of a wave crashing against the shoreline. The photograph wraps around three sides of one of the rooms. It really draws you in. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of the sea in, the, in your work? You're absolutely right. It is, it is, it is important. I mean, as, as a child, you know, when we were on the island, you know, you, you don't you don't see yourself as being at the edge, do you? You don't see yourself as as with, um, you know, the global map. You don't see yourself tucked down in the corner. You see yourself at the center, and it's the rest of the world that that um, that spreads out around you. And in a in a similar way, you know, when I imagined our region as a child, I didn't think as I didn't think that we were this tiny twenty seven mile long piece of volcanic rock hundreds of miles from, from, from any other place. We saw ourselves as part of this network, this community, this neighbourhood of the archipelago, of, of islands, and some of them, you know, huge, you know, our big sister Madagascar. And beyond that, the Swahili coast, and, you know, we, it, it never felt remote. The sea was the horizon, the colours, the shifting of all of that. Aesthetically, emotionally, psychologically, very important. But when, when I was in Tasmania a few years ago working on a project with the um, uh, University of Monash, it was a, um, a Frontier Wars forum, and we were working with the First Nations community in Tasmania. And when, I, and when I left, they said to me, we are not separated by the sea, we are connected by it. Because one of their ancestral uh, or spirit, spiritual gods is, is, um, is, is a goddess of sea um, or the ocean. And it was really beautiful because it because it's something that is often, I think, even for us from our region, you know, on the other side of the Indian Ocean, the domination, the cultural domination of a Eurocentric vision is still very prevalent. So there is often that instilled idea that the sea does, the sea is something to be traversed, even though coming from a place, you still have a very different kind of emotional connection to, to what water means, there was still very much that domination of thinking that things need to be traversed, that you are separated. I found it quite a really beautiful statement, you know, a really beautiful thing to be left with by that community, to think that actually this is the connector of all of us. Because, you know, the, the pre-colonial history or pre-European presence of Madagascar describes, you know, marine 
seagoing marine warriors, you know, for example, that um, the Betis Nizaraka, you know, would meet, would, would congregate, which was, which is an eastern coastal tribe of Madagascar. And they would bring together what was, the, what's described as 500 canoes holding 60 men. And that would create this army of 25,000. And they would go on these very, you know, quite significant journeys, you know, from, from northern Madagascar, you know, up the, up the East African coast and trading, you know, often going as far as southern India, it has been recorded. I mean, we can't contemplate that from a, from a, from a Eurocentric perspective. You know, we see the complexity of, of sea navigation, the danger, the fear of it, in a sense. But here you have these individuals that are that are traversing huge distances and en masse and in what we what we couldn't imagine almost as being a form of travel across across last large distances of water. So, you know, these were very much marine worlds. You know, the idea and, 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 and the shifting of, of, of our relationship, I think, has very much to do with with um, with colonization. So that is that is one one understanding what 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 water and, and coming from a place that is that is um, that is so dominated by it. But then beyond that, as I was saying before, are you know these spaces that the, the light that is created on the island, you know, the weather moves very very fast because it's oceanic weather. All islanders will be able to tell you this. You know, we you know we are not so subject to the the weather that takes place on on continental spaces. It is actually the sea weather that that we experience and it moves fast. And so the light continuously changes. For example, time that I have spent with um, with community in the Isle of Skye and talking about, for example, some of the the ways in which um, in Gaelic language that that light and colour, often the same words used to describe multiple shades of, of greens and blues and the word for glass and light often becoming, you know, often the same phrases because they describe this continuous shifting of things and how this flux of of the state of the sky and and that reflection of the sea, you know, the two often being the same and um, and how that changes and shifts your sense of being and your sense of space. I think these are really important things. And I think very much islanders would relate to that because I think it does dominate the way that you that you feel and if and as a painter definitely how does this feature in work such as sea shanty so in sea shanty this is really a, this is a site specific video work it was presented in in fort adelaide which is a black volcanic brick fort that was built by the british in on on, on a hill overlooking port louis it is a it is a it would have been a hand carved black volcanic stone large blocks that you know you, one contemplates it's important why, why, why i mentioned this at the beginning that you know that that each of those blocks of stone has been moved has been carved and moved by hand i think it's really important to 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 think about that when you think of this huge monolithic black fortress and inside of it is this seeping minerality because volcanic stone obviously is very full of mineral. And so over time, this white mineral sort of seeps out. And so the stones slowly start to have this very reflective white staining starts to appear. And so in one of the rooms of this fortress, this video work sort of unravels. And it is, a, it is very simply, it is an early 20th century photograph of the coastline of the island. It's like a panoramic taken from the sea, from a ship, of the island. So it's the view of the island from the water. As Francois Verges often talks about, we must not always think of the sea, of us, of, of, of the perspective and understanding of water coming from the land. We also have to understand the position of the land in relation to the sea. I think that's really, really, it's, it's, it's a very poetically brilliant way of describing it. And so then what takes place is we, the, the video very slowly pans through this photograph. It's a very simple thing that is projected and very texturally projected onto these stones um, and this very reflective white minerality. And the audio piece that plays alongside it is an Irish sea shanty. And it's an Irish sea shanty that is singing about um, somebody has gone to sea and they are lost at sea and, you know, they will not find their way home. And it is, you know, that very classic, classic subject for a seafaring community of all seafaring communities, right, you know, of being lost, of being being displaced from home. Goodbye. Away. 
played that video work in in um, in, the, in Fort Adelaide. What was so interesting was the Mauritians that came, the, the, the audience that came, who were so mesmerised by that voice echoing throughout throughout this fortress and asking me what was that voice where does that accent come from and I describe you know because you know the nation of Ireland was very much involved in running the merchant navy in, in being present in, in the British navy uh, that was very much a group of people that would have been tra- traveling along those trade routes but you know not that it's necessarily so, so important specifically to that group but it's about the voices that exist at either ends of these huge trade routes and for sure, at one point, they were slave trade routes, but but always they have been the commodity moving. And so it's interesting to think about the positioning of these two spaces and the idea of displacement and the vision of land from the sea, what these relationships are. And then projected, you know, very, like I said, very textually upon what is really, you know, the core of the island, the core of the land, you know, the volcanic rock that has come out and often, you know, volcanic stone being such a great metaphor for the violence that the land has 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 witnessed and so in that sense you know this work very much thinks about the relationship between water and land and one exists with the other right the sea is what brought the communities together is what creates the archipelago but it is also the means of which people would would were dispossessed were displaced and also the means of which material was extracted and extractivism takes place so there are these complex relationships that exist with us and i think which is why it continues to be this really important metaphor for us as 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 people so we were just talking about the ocean and about how the sea can be a great connector of people places and ideas but i think we also want to talk about land in relationship to these places that were colonized. Natural resources and plants, which are almost effectively pieces of the land, were physically taken from these places and then brought to Europe and put into museums or botanical gardens. I mean, for sure, we often hear that if if these institutions didn't collect these objects, if these collections didn't exist, they, we wouldn't have access to this knowledge, to this insight. But I think what what we often forget is that actually the the environment within which collecting was made possible was because of the destructive processes that were taking place. Recently, I've I've just been finishing this uh, fellowship with the Delphine Foundation here in London, and it has allowed me to work with Kew Gardens and their collection. And Kew, you know, released a very interesting statement recently in which it talks about its legacy as being a major mechanism of the British Empire, saying that it was actually an economic botany collection. It was, in a, in a way, to scientifically find the next material or resource in the continuation of empire building and, and wealth creation, industrialization, And that really was its primary purpose. And so within Q today, there is a department with the oldest part of Q and, and has been um, and, and is now known as the economic botany collection and so it's been very interesting to work with them and for example to look at some of the director's letters that they have that they have been able to to recently digitize what what what, what's so amazing what it reveals is is the extent at which everybody is being encouraged to collect at this particular point i guess somewhere in around you know sort of the mid of mid 1800s everybody is being encouraged to collect and and, you know, of all different positions, all different stations, you know, with, within, within the colonial project, whether you're working in the Navy or, or, or in a colonial office or you're an administrator, everybody is being encouraged um, to, to collect. And often they, the, the fact that they are in the place and, and, and able to collect, so often you see letters that describe this place is of extreme, we've never seen a place of such extreme um, diversity in plants, we will be cutting it down tomorrow you know, to, to, for the, for the plantation or, or whatever construction that is, that is taking place. And so, you know, we have to understand in the way that Q itself has, has described its, its own process, 
or, or you know or its, its own history that that often the environment of collecting goes hand in hand with the environment of destruction and the end erasure so it is unfortunately not good enough to sort of say that the that the existence and preservation of collections that that museums are obviously very good at doing today is enough to in, in a way to deal with their legacy of how these things have come about to be there whereas q is in a very interesting position because it has the means to in a sense repair to create reparations for some of the destruction that that it feels it, it was a part of creating um, and that is through the rewilding the returning of indigenous plants and trees and i think uh, this is not obviously something that is not necessarily so directly obvious for different or for all types of collections um, or historical collections. But what it does, I think, reflect is um, sort of metaphorically, symbolically, are that actually there are pathways of which we can think about what are the purposes of these institutions? How are you going to define yourself going forward? And for sure, you know, connecting and healing in some form or way with the past i think are really important parts of how institutions have to reimagine themselves and there is no doubt that nearly every major institution globally around the world has to go through this process do you have any other projects that you're currently working on and how do these projects, in addition to the project with Delphina Foundation and Kew Gardens, tie in with the idea of archives and memory? Um, well, one major part of that project is, is, is I, I'm working with a, a fantastic dancer, a performer and an artist, um, Nicolas Faubert um, from France. We're creating um, a series of performative works and film work that is interacting with the collections at Kew right now. That will manifest into various different um, exhibitions um, as we go forward this year. And it is partly thinking about at uh, this stage in this work, it's thinking about how do we navigate, how, you know, what does it mean psychologically, emotionally to connect often to collections that that are representative of your own self, your own potentially your own cultural origin, but things that you have not even yourself had connection to. So you're discovering it in a, in a, in a, in a space, on the other side of the world in a very alien environment to your own, potentially. And what does that mean? What does that mean to connect with that? And in terms of a live collection, which is why it's also, you know, the, the botany collections are really very interesting in this way because they are living creatures. And so, and often they have come from the spaces, perhaps that they are even more indigenous than we are to our own places of origin or our own senses of origin. And, and, and often, you know, environments that no longer exist, ecologies that no longer exist. And so it's, you, you can almost think about this dialogue you can have with your past because it is a relic of our past and we are also relics of its past as they live in these really grand, almost spaceship-esque silos. And so I think they're really very powerful spaces and again, a really important metaphor in, in, in our own questioning of what it means to reconnect to knowledge and senses of who we are when we have been separated by that. So this is kind of manifesting its way into lots of different performative and, and moving image based works this year. We we'll definitely look forward to that. That's, I think that's really interesting also, um, just in terms of places like Mauritius and Reunion Island having a, a past that was, you know, they were uninhabited islands um, prior to the plantation system and colonization. And so thinking about what kind of ecology, what kind of botany was there before people were there. And so, yeah, that, that idea of prehistory is really striking. I mean, one of those things that really stands out in those, in those letters, in the director's letters is more than once are people describing that they have never been to a place of such extreme diversity in, um, in, its, in its flora and definitely would have been representative of all the Mascarene Islands. Because as you say, you know, these were places, these were islands that, you know, they were volcanic islands, they had erupted out of the sea. They did not have, generally, they had no mammals on them. There were very few predators. So, you know, that, these, these really extraordinary variety of land walking birds that in many ways would never exist to been able to exist in, in any other place were able to for thousands of years, you know, millions of years. And, and in a sense, um, on these little islands of paradise until humanity touches them 
and then it all changes very very quickly and they are i think like we were saying before very important metaphors for for where we're heading at this point in time Thank you to Shiraz Beiju for talking to me today. Shiraz is a contemporary multidisciplinary artist who works with film, painting, photography, performance, and installation. He has exhibited with the Institute of International Visual Arts in London, the New Art Exchange in Nottingham, the Dhaka Art Summit, the Biennale of Sharjah, the Biennale of Dakar, and the Biennale of Sydney. He is a recipient of the Gasworks Fellowship and the Arts Council of England. He is an artist in residence at the Delphina Foundation and has recently been awarded the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. You can see Shiraz's work as part of the exhibition Archives of Resistance and Repair at the Neue Gallery Innsbruck. The immersive exhibition also includes work by artists Maeve Brennan and Onyaka Igwe, and it was curated by Lexington Davis and by me, Julia DeFabo. The exhibition illustrates that archives are not neutral sources of information, but are carefully shaped by institutions of ideological objectives. The unequal hoarding of information and resources has shaped how history is told and meaning is made. The three artists in the exhibition expose how there are hidden power dynamics within archives. Their work questions who and what has been left out, suppressed and forgotten. They remind us that the future can only be negotiated through reconciliation with our past. Archives of Resistance and Repair has been extended until March 2022, and it runs alongside the exhibition Options at Kunst Pavilion. These two exhibitions mark the 2021 to 2022 exhibition program for the Kunst Pavilion and Neue Gallery Innsbruck. The exhibition program is entitled Dancing at the Edge of the World, and it alludes to the eponymous essay collection by Ursula K. Le Guin. In this essay collection, the science fiction author outlines alternative social and societal realms of possibility that are not anchored in a colonial, patriarchal, and xenophobic narrative structure. Likewise, the exhibitions at Kunst Pavilion and Neue Gallery ask how we can renegotiate ways of living together so that we do so in a more empathetic way both in a local and in a global context. In a present shaped by a pandemic and virulent socio-political issues, the big question of how do we live together seems to have fallen by the wayside. The current and upcoming exhibition program looks for ways that we can integrate diversity on our planet into everyday considerations. How can our relationship with the environment be shaped responsibly? What ways of living together could prove to be beneficial? And how can a conscious approach towards the past and its vivid heritage succeed? 